गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग ऑल राइट गुड इवनिंग नाउ जय हिंद गुड इवनिंग so let's understand how this is going to work right let's understand how this is going to work now this evening we have all evening batches that have been combined together right all evening batches have been combined together so if i am able to recollect i think b d uh, f g right uh, all of these similar batches n i think they should all be the evening batches that have been combined a lot of you requested the institute and also requested me that the last few days that the classes happened physically at the at the institute uh, unfortunately uh, a lot of you were not able to attend the physical classes because of illness because of certain issues so what i've decided and what i'm going to do here today is and please attend pay absolute attention to this what we're going to do is we're going to start from scratch from theme number 3 which is fundamental rights directive principles of state policy and fundamental duties in most of your evening batches in a few of your evening batches in a few of you some portions of this would have already been done till let us say the layer 1 of it in some one or two topics of layer 2 may have also been done so you have the absolute freedom to attend everything right from start right everything right from start or you also have the uh, opportunity you also have the absolute freedom to attend right from where your classes were left out okay right from where your classes were left off okay so you can attend as per your ease we're going to start with theme number 3 which is rights directive principles and fundamental duties if you want to attend everything from scratch go ahead if you want to only attend whatever is 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 something that you've not covered you can attend from there itself all right understood okay i am just checking the volume i think the volume is okay there's absolutely no problem uh please check from your end uh is the volume okay is everything fine with the volume yes everything is fine with the volume on our end the volume might be an issue from your end Okay good evening uh boys and girls ladies and gentlemen welcome in the evening now today today the class is approximately from about 5 to 7 o'clock as you understand today is a last minute class because uh, my colleague vibha sir wasn't available had to attend to something rather urgent and pressing and therefore uh therefore uh you know i'm taking a class today at 5 o'clock but from tomorrow onwards my class is going to be from 7 pm to approximately 9 pm and these are going to be continuous classes and in one go in the next 15 20 classes or so i will finish your entire polity syllabus for all evening batches in one shot okay so i hope this is okay i hope this is 
perfectly fine right okay excellent if the volume is a problem just give me a second i'll wear a jacket Okay, this should be fine, this should be okay, you shouldn't really have a problem hearing me anymore. Alright, fine, okay. Raksham, please read article 368 and then ask me that question. So let us start. We're okay. We're good. Everybody's fine with this now. All right. Tell you. <coughs> We're going to now begin with theme number three, which is. Fundamental Rights, Directive Principles of State Policy and Fundamental Duties. As you would know, Fundamental Rights are in Part 3 of the Constitution. Directive Principles are in Part 4 of the Constitution. And Fundamental Duties are in Part 4A of the Constitution. The very fact that you are able to see a capital letter after the number 4, which means fundamental duties were added later to the constitution of India and they were added through the 42nd constitutional amendment 1976. Now unlike our previous two themes or unlike say the theme number 2 which is preamble, territory and citizenship, where in most cases, the topics of the preamble, territory and citizenship were not particularly co-dependent on each other, were not particularly correlative of each other. There was some conceptual congruence, there was some conceptual overlap. We were able to understand citizenship better with certain foundational concepts of territory but largely the topics under theme number two which was preamble territory and citizenship could be studied in isolation could be studied in silos but that's not the case with theme number three and i choose to teach you theme number three in an integrated manner and this theme though incredibly important for your civil services preparation. They have guaranteed questions in the pre and guaranteed questions in the mains. This particular theme is often overdone, overindulged with, with an unnecessary amount of technicalities, which are often not needed as far as the exam is concerned. So we have to be very careful to the depth and to the scope of which we are going to be studying theme number three, which is rights, principles and directive and fundamental duties. So our first order of business is to identify and outline and know exactly how we are going to be studying theme number three. Our standard format sort of remains the same. Our standard format is that layer one, which is conceptual and factual in nature, therefore important for the prelims exam. And then we've got layer two, 
which is analytical in nature and therefore important for the means exam and we will connect layer 1 to layer 2 we will connect layer 1 to layer 2 through a phase this connecting phase is also equally important and will be able to make you understand the progress of our discussion in a concise and clear manner so what is it that we must study as far as the prelims is concerned as far as these three topics are concerned what are the kind of questions that are asked and on the basis of the kind of questions that are asked we should be able to uh, identify we should be able to uh, uh, draw a boundary to the matter okay so let us look at it let's understand uh, uh, what we're essentially going to be doing as far as the outline is concerned so let us start so the first element that we're going to be studying is the core features the core features of rights, directive principles and duties together in a comparative basis, right? These core features include the origin, this includes interrelationship, This includes legal status, legal status includes two things, enforceability and the process for changing these. So two things, enforceability and amenability. And so on and so forth, right? the core features of the three once we've understood this we will then move to understanding very specific kind of questions that are asked in the pre these are trick based questions these are identification questions these are identification questions okay so when we do identification questions we'll understand how to identify which one is a fundamental duty or a directive principle of state policy and if it is a directive principle of state policy what kind of a directive principle of state policy is it right features as you would also know would include a lot of discussion a lot of understanding into a lot of details of it such as the classification and so on and so forth as well and from classification we would largely be moving on to identification once we are done with this we will move to the phase part which connects us to layer number two and we will article by article go through each of the substantive rights from articles 14 to articles 32 which are for fundamental rights and we'll look at a cursory glance of directive principles and fundamental duties but our primary focus is going to be to read through each of the articles we'll do this article by article clause by clause and understand what exactly is it which is mentioned in our rights so this is the cursory glance once we are ready with the cursory glance, once we've gone through the basic provisions of our core fundamental rights, we will then move to layer two of our preparation, which is largely important for the means. What is it that we should be covering as far as layer two is concerned? From legal status, which is amenability, and interrelationship you will understand 
that they give birth to two extremely important doctrines. Doctrines are nothing but principles of the constitution which have been developed by the court of our country, by the apex court of our country. So we will take a magnifying glass, look at the interrelationship and the amenability and we will understand two extremely important doctrines. So from amenability of fundamental rights, from amenability of fundamental rights, we will understand a very important principle called the doctrine of basic structure. The doctrine of basic structure. And from interrelationship, which is the relationship between fundamental rights and directive principles, we will also understand an interpretation called the doctrine of harmonious construction. The doctrine of harmonious construction. All right? Extremely important. Both of these are very, very likely to be asked in the exam. And then we will look at certain rights-based issues. We will look at certain rights-based issues and we'll cover them across all the three. And now you would understand why I would do this. So, for example, we will look at issues pertaining to Article 19. Under Article 19, we will look at issues with respect to the press, issues with respect to dissent, right? issues with respect to censorship. Now, while fundamentally, the primary issues around press is Article 19, say, the freedom to circulate a publication, for example, the freedom to be able to uh, broadcast one's thoughts, the freedom to be able to have independence of press, the, the lack of dedicated uh, defined rights for our journalists in our country. When we discuss all of them, no doubt, fundamentally, they are principally a violation of Article 19 if, if, they, are, if they are an issue. But they also have an overlap to 14 uh, and say 21 for that matter, right? Extremely important. Then we will also understand, say for example, censorship. We look at film censorship, we look at OTT, nowadays OTT censorships in the form of the IT rules of 2021, where we're looking at self-regulation of several platforms such as Netflix, such as Amazon, uh, Disney Hotstar, and so on and so forth, right? We look at certain censorship issues. And again, Principally, no doubt, they are issues of Article 19, but they also have some amount of overlap to Article 14 and 21 as well. So we we'll do them with focus on 19, but we'll also spend some time on the other rights as well. Similarly, we'll pick up Article 21, and when we study Article 21, we will obviously pick up, uh, say, LGBTQIA as LGBTQIA plus no doubt is an issue of personal liberty but it is also correlative to expression that is why I do them collectively because it's never just about article 21 similarly we will cover privacy we will cover euthanasia and so on and so forth euthanasia is nothing but mercy killing, right? Cover euthanasia and so on and so forth. I will also get into a reservation debate in the in just the right amount of, of, of uh, depth that is needed so that you understand exactly what it is that we have to get into and we'll also look at certain larger issues in and around secularism or religion. We'll also spend some time on uniform civil code right and these are the larger things that we should be covering in layer 2 and once we are done with this the last part of layer 2 
a, a, a more generic evaluation of each of these three parts. We will look at reforms that can be made to rights, directive principles and fundamental duties. So we'll start from here. Then we will use the bridge, understand this, understand each of the important articles and then we'll move to a deeper and an analytical understanding of each of the following articles. All right. So this is largely how it is going to work. This is largely what we intend to do in the defined space that we have. Right. So this is the outline. Uh, I'll, I'll give you about 30 seconds to have a look about 30 seconds to note this down in case you want to and then I can continue with the rest of it. So this is exactly how we will continue and we'll study part theme three which is rights, directive principles and fundamental duties. Okay. Clear layer one, bridging it by a phase by phase to layer two and finish layer two. All right. Now, right at the very beginning, let us understand certain key insights from previous year questions as far as the prelims and the mains is concerned with respect to theme number three. What are some do's and don'ts? What are some probabilities and improbabilities as far as you know our prelims and means is concerned? So let's understand this. Let's look at certain basic ground rules. So first, when we try to understand the prelims part of it, at no point of time, the UPSC will ask you technical details, which means clauses and subclauses of the articles pertaining to rights, directive principles, or duties. In fact, directive principles barely have a few subclauses, a few of them do. Duties don't even have uh, subclauses as such. But yes, um, as far as rights are concerned, you will have um, several, you, as far as rights are concerned, you will have uh, several clauses and subclauses, clauses uh, and therefore uh, students tend to get um, extremely, uh, extremely, uh, you know, worried and get carried away and they tend to memorize what is called the text of all the fundamental rights. The chances of you being asked this is negligible. Nobody is going to ask you in the prelims, for example, which of the following are reasonable restrictions under Article 19, Clause 2. Nobody is going to do that. Never. Never ever in the prelims are sub-clauses or technical details ever asked as far as the exam is concerned. Right? As long as you broadly know what fundamental right corresponds to what, you are okay. You, you should know 21 is right to life and liberty. You should know 18 is about abolition of tit uh, titles. 17 is about abolition of untouchability. All of that is fine. As long as you know those things are okay. You don't need to know what is 18 clause 1, what is 18 clause 2. Nobody, nobody is going to ask you those kind of questions. They are often and in all circumstances not asked in the exam. Third, you often get application based questions okay you often get application based questions which means they will take a real life issue and they will ask you which which fundamental right seems to be violated right again no technical details are ever asked 
but broadly now there is a trick to this the trick to this is unless it is very specifically derived unless it is very specifically derived and one of the options contains article 21 please be rest assured please be rest assured that the answer is going to be 21 give you a simple example a few years ago in one of the previous year questions uh, the UPSC had asked the freedom to marry as per one's own choice is a fundamental right under what there were several uh, uh, options one of them was the freedom of speech and expression the other was uh, right to life and liberty under 21 uh, there was I think something to do with religion also article 25 the freedom to uh, to conscience practice practice, profess uh, and, and propagate religion, Article 25. And then I think there was another article to do with Article 14 or, some, or something as such. Right. Now, that's, that's the interesting part. You would be surprised, a lot of the students who were preparing for a year got confused and marked Article 19 and came back because they said the freedom to marry and marriage is a form of expression. So freedom to marry has to be uh, uh, an extension of Article 19 because Article 19 also says I have the freedom to reside anywhere I want to, to, to travel anywhere I want to, to express myself in any how I want to. Valid, your points are absolutely valid. But all of that, that can also be explained when you have personal liberty guaranteed to you under Article 21. Why worry when Article 21 is here right so in such a scenario when you get a question and you're confused and one of the options is article 21 please make sure that you mark that as the correct answer okay there are some very specific derivations for example we will study how right to information is an implied fundamental right under article 19 now in such a scenario if article 19 is in one of the options then of course article 19 this is called the proximity trick. For me to express myself freely, I should be able to obtain the necessary information that helps me articulate my opinion freely. And because fundamental rights are largely available against the state, and we'll come to that later, because they are, they are for me to, to, to keep a check on, on certain uh, transgressions by the state, which basically means if I don't have the freedom uh, to obtain information, I don't have the freedom to freely express my opinion, even if the opinion is on the government or of the government, right? So that is why Article 19 is a derivative fundamental right under uh, a right to information is a derivative fundamental right under Article 19, right? Is a derivative fundamental right under article uh, RTI is a derivative fundamental right under article 19 so this is something you must know now apart from this this is important you have to be very very careful in reading the text of the options the text of the options that are asked to you um, in the prelims exam as far as these questions are concerned a lot of times you will see descriptive questions. They'll give you a long paragraph and they'll ask you which right is being violated in this paragraph, right? Uh, that paragraph will be about a concept. That paragraph is going to be about a, a specific um, set of things that have gone wrong. Remember, a lot of times, polity questions are also English comprehension questions, okay? What I mean to say is simplify the text filter what is absolutely necessary from that three four lines of a long text which has been given to you in the context of fundamental rights directive principles or duties okay and read if if it is a question which says which of the following statements are true they've given you two three option choices read the options carefully there's a very good chance some of the options are going to be contradictory to each other. That either option one or option three can exist, both of them cannot exist together. 
right they cannot exist together so in such a scenario it is extremely important and pertinent to note that you can easily eliminate option 1 versus option 3 on the basis of reading the text of the comprehension okay so these are some key insights that you should always remember in mind when you're looking at questions from theme number three in the prelims exam and if you could just excuse me for 20 seconds Now, as far as the means is concerned, and we will do a PYQ analysis of 2013 onwards questions, because that's really when the pattern has changed. And this is enough for you to know exactly what kind of questions do you have to prepare for and what kind of questions should you be ignoring, right? What are some key insights? First. When we do those doctrines, the doctrine of basic structure and the doctrine of harmonious construction, of course, in the course of our class, uh, I'm going to have a detailed discussion right from, you know, a plethora of cases to give you some, some, some trailer into it from, say, Shankri Prasad to Sajjan Singh to Golaknath to Kesananda Bharti to Minerva Mills to Vaman Rao to a very limited extent and to I.R. Kohelo. And several constitutional developments such as the First Amendment, the 17th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, the 25th Amendment, the 26th Amendment, the 29th Amendment, the 42nd Amendment, the 44th Amendment, in where in somewhere in the middle you will also see the 39th Amendment. Now don't get overwhelmed with all of this because the kind of questions that are asked in the mains are very analytical in nature. You don't need to know the technical, historical or the constitutional historical developments. You need to know them in so far as it helps you understand what is going on. And to that extent, I will of course equip you, equip, equip you with the right amount of knowledge. But what the means exam really asks you is, for example, is the basic structure doctrine justified? How can you nullify it? Is it justified to control the parliament's power to amend the constitution. To what extent is it justified? The real questions are what happens after all these developments. So remember this, don't get too caught up, don't get too worried about the, the technical details of all of this. You have to broadly look at an analysis. Second, when we look at questions that are usually asked from fundamental rights, now, there are largely two kinds of questions. One, if the Supreme Court has delivered a judgment on a specific rights issue, that X law was violative of Y fundamental right, or X action or incident was violative of Y fundamental right, then the UPSC is not going to ask you whether the judgment was right or wrong, whether there is a violation or not. That's not something that they're going to ask you they are going to ask you what happens after that judgment. For example, in 2017, when the Supreme Court, in one of modern India's most influential judgments, called the, the Right to Privacy case or, or the Puttu Swami case, which actually is a case challenging certain provisions um, of, of the Aadhaar Act, um, and this was about the constitutionality of certain provisions and the way the Aadhaar Act was passed, the Supreme Court nonetheless declared that right to privacy is an implied fundamental right primarily under Article 21 but also is correlative to other fundamental rights as well, right? The question that the UPSC asked you was examine the impact or examine the scope 
of the recent Supreme Court judgment on the right to privacy. Now that India legitimately recognizes the right to privacy as a fundamental right, what difference is it going to make towards the evolution and the development of other issues which are driven by privacy? For example, marital rape, LGBTQ, abortion, data privacy, information privacy, the right to be forgotten, and so on and so forth. So if the judgment has been delivered to you, if the judgment has been delivered to you, all you need to know is the impact of that judgment. All you need to know is the analysis of that judgment. What is that judgment going to lead to? That's the first part. If the judgment has not been delivered, if the judgment has not been delivered, right? This is something which is of extraordinary importance uh, in the news. This is something which is in your face. And this is what usually happens in the means exam. The kind of current affairs that they ask with respect to rights issues are in your face current affairs. They are in your face current affairs. Okay. It is something that you, even if you want to escape, you can't escape. For example, when things had reached to such a level with respect to, you know, uh, certain actions by the state to, to suppress dissent, which was expressed technologically, what I'm referring to is Section 66A of the IT Act, which later on in the Shreya Singhal case was declared as unconstitutional. Um, and it was in news very recently because despite it being unconstitutional, there were several cases, there were several FIRs being filed across the country on a law that does not exist or on a provision of a law that does not exist. But, 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 what did the UPSC ask and when did the UPSC ask this? UPSC asked this question in 2013. The Shreya single case had not <coughs> come out by then. So what the UPSC did really ask you, what the UPSC did really ask you was what? Was this, discuss the alleged violation of Section 66A of the IT Act. Discuss the alleged violation because there was no judgment on it yet. Things had become uh, so, uh, I think, uh, problematic. But I think two girls in Bombay were arrested over a Facebook post where they criticized the government for shutting down the city of Bombay over the death of a political leader, uh, Bal Thakre, at that time. Uh, the post basically said that, why do we have to do this? It is unnecessarily convenient. Uh, and, and the post was, was of course, uh, satirical in nature. And the government thought it was disrespectful to the lineage and the legacy of such a great political uh, personality. Anyways, the question is, there was no judgment yet. So then the UPSC asked you, then the UPSC asked you, is Section 66A violative of Article 19 of the Constitution? Okay, so always remember this. If there is a Supreme Court judgment, if there is a Supreme Court judgment, <coughs> you will always be asked the impact of it. If not, you would be asked whether or not there is a, <coughs> whether or not, it is violative or not in the first place, right? That is something we must understand. Now comes the most important issue. This is where students often get carried away a lot because in India, for good or bad reasons, uh, these two notions are an extremely important part of our society whether you associate with it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you want to be affected by it or not, the harsh and the dark reality remains that these two notions are an integral part of who we are. It is an identification matrix. What I'm talking about is religion and caste, right? Now, of course, <coughs> these contribute a majority of developments 
that happen across the year. And I often see uh, students of the civil services get into unnecessarily detail when it comes to religion and caste. And let me tell you, <coughs> how exactly would the UPSC be delivering a question on this? <coughs> Sorry. So, let's understand this. The UPSC is never going to ask you your opinion on a specific incident pertaining to religion or caste. You can use an incident to explain a question. That is fine. But the UPSC is never ever going to ask you very specifically your opinion on a specific issue of religion or caste. For example, the UPSC will never ask you do you think the Sabri Mala judgment was right or wrong? Do you think uh, triple talaq is right or wrong? Do you think Maratha reservation and the issues around it were right or wrong? No. You can use this to answer larger questions on evolution of fundamental rights. But you will never be asked a direct question on your opinion. For example, this year in 2021, um, there was a question in the in the mains exam, uh, which was, I think, the very first question, which was that constitutional morality is 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 rooted within the constitution and is based on its essential facets. Explain the doctrine of constitutional morality with relevant judicial decisions or examples. So you can use this Sabri Mala issue as one of the examples of constitutional morality. Similarly, Triple Talak, similarly, Kesananda Bharti. We'll get into discussions on how you would write an answer on that later. But you can use them to explain. But they will never ask you a detailed 10 marker or a 15 marker on what is your opinion on it. There is a reason behind it. Because if the UPSC asks you your opinion on a specific religion or a caste issue, your opinion on a specific religion or a caste issue would be an opinion reflected or influenced by your own religion and caste. And the marks that you're going to get on a subjective answer would be awarded to you by an examiner who would also be influenced by his, her or their own religion or caste. So this could be discriminatory against you to ask your opinion on a specific religion or a caste based issue, right? Which is why they will ask you questions which are collective in nature. For example, with religion, they will ask you a question on uniform civil code. Do you think the idea of a consolidated law taking into account the variations of marriage, divorce, adoption, property across all religions in one law, is that a wise idea or not? If you can have a labor code, why can't you have a religious code, which is the uniform civil code? There are points for and against this, but of course, these are questions that can be asked. You will never be asked a question on, do you think uh, uh, specific religious conversions are a problem? Or do you think specific issues of conversion are a problem? None of that would, would ever really be asked. No. Similarly, the only question the UPSC has really asked about caste is, do you think your body, such as the National Commission of Scheduled Castes, Scheduled Tribe or Backward Classes, are they doing a good job? That is it. Because this is about upliftment of all castes in general, not a specific caste. Right? Having said that, these topics also overlap with vulnerable sections in governance and also social issues. So you are supposed to have a reasoned opinion just in case you have to write it in another part of the GS or an essay and I will train you for that. And I am sorry to say this um, and please don't take it the other way. While teaching you fundamental rights, I will suspend your own fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression. Because, as you know this, my only political ideology, 
my only political ideology is that I am a Marxist, right? Now, what kind of a Marxist I am? I am a Marxist with an S, perhaps not an X, which means my only religion, my only caste, my only purpose of existence is to make sure you get the most of this in your papers, okay? So, whatever will be written, will be written under my strict instructions. I will give you your specific opinions on censorship, on dissent, on protest, on religion, on caste, and you will stick to those because after all, we are here for a very specific purpose. We are all Marxists with an S and not an X. So let's remember that. Let's remember what our purposes here are. And of course, these are some of the insights that you should always remember as far as the means exam is concerned. These are some of the insights that we must always remember as far as the means exam is concerned. Okay? Clear? All right. So this is what we have to be prepared for. This is something that we have to do. This is exactly how we are going to be going about it. These are our larger objectives. Right? Now, <coughs> I will introduce to you something today and then of course we'll do substantive portions later on and I'll introduce them to you immediately. Okay. So let's start with layer one. Okay. Let's start with layer one. When we start with layer one, which is conceptual and factual in nature and therefore is important for the prelims exam. Let us first broadly understand what is it that we are talking about? What are these rights, directive, principles, duties uh, that, you know, we keep harping upon, right? So let's understand this. Okay. Now, I need you to forget about rights, directive, principles and duties. They seem very complicated. They seem very technical. They seem very heavy things. You know, let's, let's look at it from a completely unrelated angle. Let's forget about the fact that we're in a law class. Let's completely forget about the fact that we are here discussing extremely complex, sensitive subjects. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about us, average Indians, with larger than life dreams, right? That's why you are here, that's why I'm here, right? So let's understand this. For a typical middle class Indian family, one of the most important milestones as far as the family is concerned, as far as you and I are concerned, is the fact, is the fact that we're able to buy a car. A car buying experience in Indian society, and you could look at it from a sociological context, you could look at it from a globalization context, there are, I'm sure there are, there are several discourses on this, but buying a car for an average Indian family, I remember the first time um, you know, I was able to afford a car, was an extraordinary experience. And, and it, is, it is something that you would feel very, very proud about, that okay, you've sort of been able to do something with your life. It doesn't matter if it's a, it's a big car or a small car or a long car or a broad car, if it's, it doesn't matter if it's a muscular SUV or a sleekish sedan, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you are able to buy a four-wheeler. For us average Indians, four-wheelers are our dreams. Just remember when our parents, our families, <coughs> who were fortunate enough to buy their very first car. For example, most Indian families like us, I remember the first car in my family uh, was a Maruti 800 which my father was able to, which my father and mother, and pardon me, because both of them work in, both of them were, were able to, you know, pull in and get us a car, was after, I think, 20, 25 years of my father's service in the Indian Army. But anyways, <coughs> let's understand this, understand this uh, in a simple process, in a, in a simple exercise, okay? So that car buying experience that we are talking about, that, that, that buying experience that we are referring to. Let's understand this. There are basically two kinds of people that we refer to. Two very simple kinds of people. 
right? One, of course, is the car buyer, the family. And of course, there is a car dealer, a person from whom we are buying the car from. And the relationship between these two will help you understand fundamental rights, directive principles of state policy and fundamental duties. Unrelated, but they're actually very good analogies to understand how this is going to work, right? So let us start and let's understand this as clearly as possible, okay? So when we go decide to buy a car, when we go decide to buy a car, one of the first things that we know of is that there are certain things that, that come to us as entitlements. We are guaranteed these, these are our privileges. Nobody can take them away from us. We're guaranteed these. For example, we can take as many test drives as we want to when we're buying a car. <coughs> we can ask as many questions about the car that we want to. Suppose you finalized a car and now you're getting into the technical formalities. You have the right to purchase a car insurance from anybody. It doesn't necessarily have to be the dealer. You can go online these days. You have portals which sell you insurances. You can buy the best value insurance that you want to. There's no need for you to buy a car insurance compulsorily from the dealer. Right? Similarly, before you take the final delivery of the car, before you sign on the final delivery papers of the car, you have the right to conduct what is called a pre-delivery inspection. You have the right to check how many kilometers the car has run. If the car has run 100 kilometers before you've, you've taken ownership of the car, 100 kilometers is too large a distance. The go down or the, 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 the place where the cars are, are, are kept in the showroom might be what, 10 kilometers, 20, 30, 40 kilometers away. Let us say there would have been 20 kilometers of a test drive to check whether all the electrical components and the mechanical components of the car are working perfectly. I understand that. But there's absolutely no reason whatsoever, absolutely reason, no, no reason whatsoever for the car to have run 100 kilometers, right? You have the right to check. You have the right to very clearly ask your car's car dealer when was the car manufactured, what month of the year the car was manufactured in. If you're unhappy for any of these reasons, you can decide to not take the car. You have the, you have the option if you're buying a car on, on a loan, which I strongly recommend against. But if you're buying a car on a loan, then you have the right to choose your loan partner. You don't have to necessarily go for a, a bank that the car dealer is, is recommending. Those are internal partnerships. You don't have to worry about it. Whichever bank gives you the best possible deal, is the bank that you should go to. There are no two doubts about it. There are no two questions about it, right? So that is something that we know. That is something that we're absolutely okay with. That is something that we absolutely understand, right? So these are nothing but your rights as a car buyer, right? Now, Car buying in India is a rather emotional experience. We Indians are very emotional when it comes to buying things. We are not rational people. We are sentimental people. We believe in, in building a rapport with somebody that we are buying something expensive from. Like For example, when, when, when I decided to go buy a fridge um, a few years ago because I needed to put stuff in. And as you can see, I need a bigger fridge because I need a lot of stuff to be in that fridge. Uh, very interestingly. I felt an emotional connection with the person who's selling me the fridge because it was such a, it was a big fridge of some 12, 10, 12,000 rupees and it's a lot of money. I, I, I felt that, you know, I'm, I'm, that this person is going to be a part of my life forever because I'm buying a fridge for them, right? That's exactly what we're talking about. Depending on your rapport with the car dealer, if you are nice to the car dealer, if you are respectful to the car dealer, if you are polite, you know, you are, you are not somebody who is creating a nuisance value, you are straightforward, you know, you, you, are, you, you, are, you are a good consumer, you, you are asking the right questions, you are not being impatient about it, you, you know, you are conducting yourself well. 
then the car dealer will also try to do something from their behalf or on their behalf for you. They don't have to, but they will. Sometimes they might give you an additional discount. This is called a dealer's discount. They will reduce their margin on the car and probably give you the car for slightly cheaper. Similarly, similarly, uh, they might sometimes give you an insurance product for free, such as a roadside assistance. Sometimes they might give you floor mats or a car cover or a seat cover or some accessories for free. Right? It all depends on your relationship, but it also depends on are they in a place to offer this? If business has been very tight for them, they can't afford to lose every penny. Or if the business is tight for them, they have to give external discounts so that more people are able to come buy their products. It's, it's entirely up to you. It's entirely up to the dealer. If you want to, you can, then you will. If not, there's nothing wrong. That's nothing but directive principles. If the government wants to, when the government wants to, how the government wants to, they'll want to make your life better by doing something a little extra for you. Perhaps eliminate malnutrition. Perhaps raise the standard of living. Perhaps promote cottage industries, as the directive principles tell us. It's not compulsory. If they want to, when they want to, how they want to, they'll do it for you. You cannot be fussy about it. You can't go to a court of law and say, see the government, it's written in the constitution that the government must promote cottage industries. But in this year's budget, the allocation for, for promotion of cottage industries has gone down. So the government is not implementing a directive principle. The court is going to come to you and say, come here. It is up to the government. Not you, not me. You can't force them. And a more fundamental reason, a more foundational reason why you can't force them is you can't force the government to take a policy decision because that's why they became the government in the first place. Just imagine yourself in the shoes of the elected government. <coughs> you fought one of the largest elections on the face of the planet. Indian elections are the largest democratic exercises. And that's not something to be very proud of. It's because of how populous as a country we are. It's because of the 1.3 billion people in the country that exist and, and the frequency to which you know, children are born. Of course, when we now look at fertility rates, when we look at the National Family Health Survey, things seem to be okay. But of course, India has a cascadingly high population, right? A cascadingly high population. So, what we're trying to basically say here is, and this is interesting, if you won an election, you're in the government, then at least you should have the freedom to make your own policies. Whether you want to promote cottage industries or not is entirely up to you. We can't force you to do so. And this, if you remember our four golden rules, is the first rule of that <coughs> democratic mandate. You're in power, you have the mandate to make those decisions. Right, you are in power, you have the mandate to make those decisions. And because you have the mandate to make those decisions, they become extremely important. Alright, so therefore, <coughs> what we are referring to is, is nothing but your directive principles. Now comes the duties part of it. The car has been sold to you. You have been told to be nice with the car, right? <coughs> you know, sometimes the dealers give us a lot of gyan that don't accelerate the car for more than 100 kilometers um, in the first, um, you know, in the first 100 kilometers for more than 80 kilometers per hour. Uh, don't drive it rashly. When you switch on the car in the winters, let it run on ignition for about a minute or two. Right? They give you all the gyan that keep the car clean, keep the car tidy, all of those things are there, no doubt. If you don't do it, they are not going to take your car away. The dealers are not your moral police. You don't take care of your car, the car is going to get spoiled sooner, will require more maintenance. So it is in your interest 
to take care of the car. If you don't, nobody is going to say anything to you. Nobody is going to come to your house and say, you are a bad car owner. You don't deserve to have a car because you don't clean it every day. Chi chi, bad bad. That's not going to happen. At no point of time is that going to happen. That's nothing but fundamental duties. You should take care of your car. If you don't, nobody is going to say anything to you. And through this very simple example, do you understand? Um, you understand what is called, uh, is, is, do you understand the difference between a buyer and a dealer? Right? Okay. <laughs> a buyer and a dealer. Clear? Understood this? <coughs> Clear? Okay? Alright. So now we are set. Now we are ready. From tomorrow onwards, from 7 o'clock onwards, <coughs> to study what is called the, the features of the constitution. We are going to start with layer 2. It is going to take me about a maximum of two days to finish uh, layer one, sorry. And then it's going to take me about, let, if I just run you through uh, uh, how much time is it going to take me. It's going to take me about uh, two days for, for layer one. So if you've already covered this, uh, you can join in later because, you know, we've sort of combined batches. So this is that. Uh, it is going to take me approximately two days for the first and the second topic and then it's going to take me another two to three days for applications and reforms. So three and two, five and two, seven, probably about seven days and we should be completely done with theme number three. Then of course we'll move to theme four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and ten. I'm expecting that by the end of this month or first week of next month we're going to have continuous classes up until then your entire syllabus for the entire batches of 2021 they would be covered uh, thoroughly all right okay so today was just a class to get you all on board uh, please read the notes that i've already given to you on the google drive all of you know where you'd find the google drive all you've got to do is go to google chrome all you've got to do is type bit dot your ly slash polity gov notes Atish Mathur. You will find uh, your handwritten notes and certain case studies. All you've got to do is scroll up here. You will find uh, fundamental rights, directive principles and fundamental duties here. Please read them and come to class tomorrow. Be prepared. If you read and come to class, you will always understand better. You will always be able to <clears throat> to imbibe better and then of course your doubts are going to be far more substantial all right so this is it let's let's get this started and let's uh, let's finish this up um, as soon as possible then of course we'll move to everything else and some previous year questions will also be done uh, at the end of layer one so polity previous year questions at the end of layer one means previous year questions at the start of layer two so that you understand exactly what kind of questions to expect, right? Okay, understood. And a little bit of a challenge that I have, that I give myself is that just by covering features and identification and a basic idea, just, just point one and two, just an outline, before we get to the connecting phase, just till here, <coughs> I guarantee you, you will be able to solve almost all previous year questions on theme 3 without even doing these in detail without even doing these in detail okay right understood this this is a little bit of a challenge that i'd like to give myself that without doing them in detail you're still able to solve previous year questions because that's exactly how the upsc asks these kind of questions all right i'll take your leave have a lovely evening and i'll see you um, tomorrow at uh, at seven o'clock okay thank you